Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Sue Ann Pemberton, Tri-Chair of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. In 2014, the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee developed the vision and guiding principles that serve as the foundation for the Alamo Plan. In the summer of 2021, we hosted seven content discussions to further explore the layered stories of the Alamo. I am pleased to present this meeting's topic, Still Standing, the incredible story of the church and long barrack. It focuses on the two remaining buildings from the Mission de Valero period. The church and the long barrack are two of the oldest buildings in Texas, and it is a wonder they are still standing. Many times in the last 300 years, both buildings were almost destroyed, demolished, or dismantled by one group or another. It wasn't until the 20th century that the building's significance, inspired by the preservation movement, that is still evident today. So while the stones themselves can't talk, the fact that these buildings from the original mission still stand speaks volumes to their importance in the Texan and American history. While these buildings are no doubt important, we know that the story of the Alamo would live on if they weren't here. But would it have as much impact if you couldn't walk through the Wallong Barrack or step into the church and know that men fought and died here? The indelible memories these buildings have left on visitors for more than a century have inspired generations and are what keep people coming to the site again and again. And while the history of the Alamo may last forever, without proper conservation, these two buildings will not. By telling their story, we can share their importance and garner support for their continued conservation and preservation, hopefully keeping them around for a long, long time. Good evening and welcome to our Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee content discussion. Tonight's topic, Still Standing, the Incredible Story of the Church and Long Barrack. To welcome us tonight is our Tri-Chair, Ms. Sue Ann Pemberton. Good evening and thank you all for being here. I want to recognize my fellow Tri-Chairs. Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran could not be with us this evening, but we have Araneta Pierce with us is one of our Tri-Chairs. I'd also like to recognize Lori Houston, Assistant City Manager, and Kate Rogers, who is the Executive Director of Alamo Trust. This is the second of our content discussion meetings. As an architect in preservation, I am excited about tonight's topic. Our session is called Still Standing, the incredible story of the church in Long Barrack. Our presenters and panelists represent a wealth of knowledge of the building's construction, uses, and preservation. And as a professor, I frequently use these buildings as one of the biggest adaptive reuse projects in San Antonio. And we'll learn more about that later this evening. <clears throat> thank you to our presenters and panelists for being here. I also want to thank our Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee theme captains who helped plan this meeting. Forrest Bias, Melissa Killen, Seneca McAdams, Davis Phillips, and Sharon Skrbarsik. Now I'd like to introduce George Nelson to come uh, to welcome us to the Alamo and provide a brief overview for us. George is a sculptor, a painter, an archeologist, who, whose main subject matter is Texas history. You've seen his work uh, throughout the Alamo and San Antonio, and he has generously bought, brought a copy of the Alamo and illustrated history for each of us. Thank you very much for that. Okay. George, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun, I think. Unfortunately, we have a lot of material to cover and uh, not much time. And so I'm going to jump right into it, um, if I can get the clicker to work. One of the things, um, let me get a note here. I went through my notes, and I found that there were seven different suggestions, orders, recommendations that these two remaining buildings, the church and the convento, or what you call the long barracks, were called to be demolished. Uh, once uh, in uh, 1811, once in 1824, once in 1836, once in 1849, once in 1900, and 1910. There was also a rumor uh, in um, around 1811 during the war for Mexican independence that uh, the Spanish army was going to burn the Alamo 
and it was circulated among the troops, I think among the revolutionaries, whether that was going to happen or not. Uh, the troops became upset because they thought they were going to have to leave their families and move outside of San Antonio. But uh, these two buildings dodged the bullet seven times. The rest of the compound, of course, did not. This uh, first slide is uh, uh, an example uh, of uh, all the changes that happened to the two buildings uh, in only 60 years uh, out of 300. You can imagine how much other changes there were. There, these stacked images show chronologically uh, from uh, around 1845 to around, I think, 1910 uh, of the incredible remodeling and destruction that happened uh, to these two buildings. And uh, one of the things that, that might be interesting is we're referring to them as two buildings. Actually, there's three. There's the church, the convento, and on the far left is the granary, the building that has a top that has two doors. So actually, there's three separate buildings, even though they, the, the two of them are side by side. So one of the, the building on the left, the most north building, was a granary next to the, uh, the priest house. We have, of course, an early sketch in the 1730s that's kind of a cartoon of the first uh, stage of the mission. Uh, it shows the uh, unfortified compound with some rows of Indian quarters and a church and a temporary uh, priest house. Now, this is a, a bronze model uh, of seven that are out in the plaza that I made. This one shows 1744, and in the foreground is the first stone church that was finished in 1744, and it collapsed in 1744 uh, due to the stupidity of the contractor. Uh, he, he also committed a murder and took refuge in the church before it collapsed. And so the first siege of the Alamo or standoff was not in 1830s, it was in 1744. The stonemason named Antonio Tellios uh, took refuge and then he ran away and the church fell down. The temporary church uh, is on the side of the convento. It was a, 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 an adobe hall, and it was uh, continued to be used after this first stone church collapsed. Uh, the next map that we happen to have is a uh, 1760s uh, kind of cartoon map of the mission after it had a compound completed, uh, and you can see the convento is the square at the top, and then the church is to the right, the unfinished roofed, unroofed church. And here is a, a close-up of the model, out, uh, the bronze model, showing the condition of the unfinished church with the uh, arched ribs that were to, to support a uh, vault and a dome that were not completed during this period. And then you can see that it, by this time, the convento had a beautiful two-story arcade that encircled the courtyard. And the, it was not roofed on the east side. And uh, beyond the uh, convento, you can see that there is a uh, courtyard behind the granary that was a textile shop where the mission Indian women wove uh, wool blankets and other type of cloth for the community. And uh, that's not too much emphasized, but that's a very important early technological and industrial site there because uh, you, know, you don't think about women being much associated with activities with the Alamo. It's a very masculine site, but that was the uh, uh, a textile shop that was uh, run by the women of the community. Now this is a map of the uh, that appears in the Behar archives. J Jake is going to talk about this a bit more. Uh, this this map does not have a date nor a name, but it has a, uh, a, a, a list of the components that are shown, and it, it is showing a framing diagram to cover a cross-shaped church. Uh, now, I did a sketch there to the right that, that is just a suggestion of the cross, the, how the framing would have been. Jake and I disagree on how tall it is, uh, but it's one of those things, it's just a, a conceptual sketch trying to take a flat plan and make it uh, easier to understand. Whether it was ever uh, completed, uh, Jake's going to clear that up for us. Now, I'll go back one here. Uh, well, uh, following the, the mission period, it became a uh, Spanish military post uh, for a 100-man uh, cavalry unit that were sent here after the Louisiana Purchase uh, made a very strong threat from the United States 
uh, of Anglo-Americans invading Spanish territory. And so during this period, uh, it, it was occupied uh, for, I think, 32 years by the Spanish and Mexican military. Uh, the man who is one of the most important men in the history of the Alamo is this gentleman here. His name is Anastasio Bustamante. He had been, uh, he was the military commander here in 1824. And the state legislature, in their brilliance, had decided that they needed some money, and they said that the Valero was a surplus public property. And uh, he was uh, the commander here in San Antonio, and he put his foot down, and he said, absolutely not. It's being used as a military post, and you're not going to tear it down and sell the rock uh, to make money for the uh, treasury. So if it hadn't have been for him, there would be no Alamo standing in 1836. So uh, he also became vice president of Mexico, president of Mexico, and uh, he was uh, overthrown by Santa Ana, and he was a great friend of the Indians of Texas, and uh, we don't talk about him, but he lived here for a long time and was a uh, very patriotic uh, Mexican officer and president. Here is uh, the, during the military phase, I did this model showing uh, 1793 to 1835. This is a uh, time most people don't think about, but this, before the, the uh, Alamo was fortified in the 1830s, uh, the Spanish army had moved in, and if you can tell from the slide, they, they uh, demolished the arcade that was in the backyard of the convento, and they recycled the stone in the L-shaped barracks uh, kitchen and guardhouse that's over there near the gate. And uh, they saw no point, of course, in, in keeping a giant arcade uh, patio behind the convento. There was a hospital built in the, uh, established in the uh, upstairs. Uh, it was a 40-bed hospital, and uh, they treated both the townspeople and the military. And uh, there was a very important uh, vaccination regime happened here. Uh, just a few years after Lester invented or discovered how to vaccinate for smallpox, uh, the Spanish government sent over materials for vaccination, and they took six kids from the town and six kids from the garrison of the Alamo, put them in the hospital, and vaccinated them. And uh, that was a major medical breakthrough. And uh, the, uh, the, the main problem is how much was this place used uh, besides as either a barracks? Uh, there is a mention in the Behar archives that there was a drummer academy established at Valero. Uh, so there was also another mention of a uh, cadet being assigned to an academy at Valero. So there apparently was some sort of a military academy here during the Spanish period. 1836 period, we do have uh, some maps but none of the maps, these are two Mexican officers' maps in a drawing. What you'll find is no maps uh, in the early, up until pretty, pretty late, no two maps of the Alamo ever agree with each other. They always uh, contain, uh, you know, unique uh, things that no other map shows. Now, what most people don't think about is there was a siege here in 1835 during the Siege of Bayar, and there were 500 Mexican soldiers with their families in the Alamo besieged for 54 days. So that's a very large uh, event that gets no coverage in the Alamo. But there, uh, if you think about it, most of the fortifications were done by the Mexican soldiers during the Siege of Bayar, not by the later defenders, the trenches and gun positions and things like that. This is a model showing the uh, uh, battle period uh, that in the background of the courtyards of the convento uh, and the granary, there were uh, cannon platforms and uh, entrenchments and uh, different types of fortifications uh, used to, uh, to protect the walls. Then this, this is uh, a model showing after the Battle of the Alamo that it was uh, in May of 1836, the Mexican army was ordered to uh, basically demilitarize the site. They pulled down the single walls, filled in the trenches, and pulled up the stockades and dismounted the cannons. And you can see that uh, the walls of the back courtyards are, are gone at this time. And the, um, the ruins of the Alamo assume the, the shape 
that they are later recorded in the 1840s. This is the, uh, the top drawing is the first drawing made after the battle. It was made in 1837, and it shows uh, uh, the Alamo and the uh, low barracks. Uh, and beyond it, you can see the two-story uh, convento sticking above the uh, low barracks. This is a map of the ruins uh, made by the U.S. Army in 1845. And you can see where the walls are, are missing and where the buildings, it, a lot of it's still there. And uh, this oval drawing shows the view down the church from the back of the church looking towards the front door, showing the ruined nature of the interior of the church. And then we're very lucky that during the uh, U.S. military period, in the beginning of the uh, 1848, 1847, 1849, a number of U.S. Army officers who were excellent draftsmen came and drew pictures of uh, the church. Here's the sides of the church and the back of the church, 1840, like 1848, 1847. Here's the rear of the church, and to the left, upper left, is the first photograph. But you can see that uh, we're very fortunate that some people bothered to make the effort to do these drawings because from them they're the, really the only evidence that we have in many ways of the nature of these buildings because a picture's worth a thousand words and luckily we do have a, a lot of pictures. Now this is an interesting picture made around 1841 I believe, 42, and it shows that in the niches, in the upper niches, there's still two statues and in the bottom two niches they're gone. And there's a mention in 1842 following the occupation of San Antonio by the Mexican army twice. Uh, there was a rally by uh, 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 Anglo men from East Texas came and had a rally at the Alamo. And it's mentioned that there was a statue of a saint laying on the ground in front of the church. And it's a man had uh, made a pipe out of part of the statue. And another man had sawn off a head of an angel that uh, I think he, there's an, on these pedestals, there's little angel faces in relief, blowing wind, clouds. Uh, I think he sawed one of the angel faces off the pedestal. So there was vandalism in the early 1840s. Uh, now the question is, uh, this is something that I, I figured out a long time ago that may or may not be accurate. Uh, how did the, uh, how did we get the, the famous uh, hump in the middle of the facade of the church? Well, if you study very carefully, it's a shape that's called a campanulate, which means bell-shaped. And uh, you can see that if you happen to go to Mission San Jose now, there's a, a bunch of very beautiful arches behind the church. And I was working there in 1967 when it was a state park, and I lived behind the church. And I had to walk by it every day. And I had Seth Eastman's sketchbook. And he did the bottom drawing. And if you notice if, uh, in the book, that you can look at it closely, there is the shape of the bell-shaped par uh, parapet over the center of the arches. There's three images here at the top. The bottom photograph on the left is taken later, and it is gone. The other three are in 1847, 1848, and I think 1849. Uh, the the uh, church was uh, roofed by the U.S. Army in 1850. So it's my uh, possible theory that this uh, was taken from the, the arches at San Jose and used to cover the gable, wooden gable end of the new roof at the church by the U.S. Army. We're very fortunate that uh, when the U.S. Army came, the top drawing was done in 1845, and uh, that's how it was found by the Army. And now I used to think that this is what the, it looked like at the time of the Battle of the Alamo or originally. Now I think that the, the uh, two-story part, the center part of the building was knocked down or damaged during the two sieges because there is a mention in the siege of uh, Behar in 1835 that Deaf Smith makes a bet for two pistols that he can put a cannonball between the first and second or the second and third window of the Alamo, and he does, he fires the cannon, and it does knock the uh, masonry down. So it used to apparently go straight across with two windows upstairs instead of, I mean, four windows instead of two windows. The bottom picture is how the U.S. Army remodeled the Convento, uh, and uh, to their credit, Edward Everett, who did uh, this drawing, and he he did a uh, very good uh, uh, 
piece on how he restored this. But uh, I'm going to uh, get here real quick. During the Civil War, we're lucky that uh, we do have one record. The man on the lower right-hand corner with the cannon is, uh, I think, John T. Smith. And he was a Confederate veteran interviewed in the First World War. And he was asked, is the Alamo different than it used to be? And he said, yes, there used to be. You can see up there, there's some stairs. Uh, there's two sets of stairs. He said there used to be a set of stairs in the center of the building that was the old slave market. And during the Civil War, they sold slaves there. And he talks about what the price was. Uh, but I don't think it's those two stairs. I think it's, if you look very carefully, there's a bird's eye view from 1873. There's actually two sets of stairs. Uh, there's one in the middle of the building that has a landing and, and steps. So I think it's the stairs that were in the center of the, uh, the structure. I'm going to wind it up here because uh, we've got a lot of speakers. And uh, uh, I'm going to let Jake uh, take over and give uh, his version of what he's going to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. And now to introduce uh, our other distinguished speakers, we have member of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, Forrest Bias, a uh, descendant of the Alamo Defenders. Mr. Bias. Thank you very much for that, George. Uh, bios for all our speakers and panelists were sent to the committee, and I hope you all had a chance to review them. I'd like to introduce Melissa Simmons with PGA V Destinations to discuss how tonight's topic aligns with the vision and guiding principles for the Alamo Plan. James E. Ivey was the research historian for the history program of the Intermountain Regional Office of the National Park Service until 2010. He specializes in the cultural and architectural history of the American and Spanish Southwest. Tonight, he will discuss the Mission Era building and construction at the Alamo. Scott C. Woodard is a historian in the Office of Medical History at the U.S. Army Medical Department Center of History and Heritage, Medical Center of Excellence. Tonight, he will discuss the U.S. Army's time at the Alamo. Louis F. Fisher is a celebrated San Antonio historian who has published more than 45 books, including Saving San Antonio, The Precarious Preservation of a Heritage, American Venice, The Epic Story of San Antonio's River, and Chili Queens, Hay Wagons, and Fandangos, The Spanish Plazas in Frontier San Antonio. Tonight, he will talk to us about commercialization of the Alamo and Alamo Plaza. Dr. Bruce Winders is an internationally recognized authority on the conflicts over the American Southwest between the United States and Mexico in the 19th century. He served as historian and curator for the Alamo for 23 years before leaving to become a historical consultant. Tonight, he will discuss the changes made to the church in Convento, what most know as the Long Barracks in the 20th century. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So great to see you all again. Last time we just barely scratched the surface of the broad topic, calling the Alamo home. Tonight's topic, still standing, focuses our lens down to the church and long barrack or convento buildings. These buildings have seen many moments in history, from religious ceremonies to battles, wagons full of goods to millions of tourists. But what those millions of tourists probably don't know is that the church and convento buildings we see today almost didn't survive the arduous journey through three centuries. Their existence can be credited to a handful of people who recognized their potential and foresaw their last, lasting legacy they would have on the world. The topic tonight reflects on the legacy of these two buildings and the impact they continue to have on visitors to the site. By learning more about their history, I hope that your appreciation for them grows and our dedication to their preservation continues. As George's presentation showed us, we owe most of what we know about these buildings to archival and visual evidence, such as maps and photographs. We also use written evidence in the form of missionary reports and letters, as well as archaeological evidence to show us what happened during the times before photography. This brings to mind two points from our guiding principles. 
preservation and interpretation based on historical and archaeological evidence, and balance scholarship, historical context, folklore, and myth to provide an engaging visitor experience. These two points focus on using evidence to interpret the Alamo's history. Primary sources and evidence can take many forms, and usually it takes putting together multiple sources of information to paint a clearer, more detailed picture of what happened in the past. We rely on experts, like those seated here, to interpret the evidence and put the pieces of the puzzle together so that we can understand the history. While evidence does help us to understand historical events, we also need to be aware that people saw events differently from different points of view, just as we do today. Conflicting accounts can lead to a more complex, multi-sided understanding of history, or to a one-sided view if we discount contradictory documents. We also need to embrace new evidence as it comes to light. Just as most of us don't keep every scrap note, receipt, phone record, or email we've ever sent or received, it's inconceivable that we would find a complete documentation of someone's life with everything they wrote or said recorded. New evidence surfaces every day. Perhaps it is a new letter from a witness, or it could be artifacts recovered from the site. As more evidence comes to light, we need to acknowledge it, invest the time to ensure it is authentic, and in the Alamo or any historic site's case, adjust the story to reflect it. New discoveries are being made all the time through archival research and archaeology at the Alamo. The church and convento are revealing things such as painted frescoes and forgotten foundations, as long as we know where to look for them. These buildings embody the history of the site through the physical changes and evolutions that happened over time and the enduring marks we can see, still see today. Finally, as we review this history tonight, I'd like to ask what these two buildings mean to you personally. What do you see when you actually look at them? Do you see the battle scars, the frescoes and ornate carvings welcoming people into the mission church, the names of soldiers etched on the walls? Do you see your own history reflected in the emotions you feel every time you physically stand on the Alamo grounds? I will leave you with these questions and hope that as more of their history is revealed tonight, you will appreciate even more that the church and Longberg are still standing today. This is um, the sidewalk outside the north wall of the grounds. Uh, the Evelyn Morgan is just across the street there. This right here is a place where in 1979, uh, I asked the Alamo people to ask the contractors to chop out a section of the sidewalk. Um, I didn't think at the time that maybe I should have done a little bit more arrangement-wise than just, so he did. And the reason we were asking is because we had just come across the edge of this, <clears throat> which is like five or six, seven feet across, and is, if you've seen these things before, is a fortification trench. But fortification trench at the north wall of the Alamo, North Wall at the courtyard of the, of the Alamo. I guess I should really use this. Um, Cross-section drawing of it, you can really see it a little more distinctly. And uh, as we were digging in other areas of that same North Courtyard, we found another large trench. Am I standing in the way of you guys? So when we did the uh, laying out and the measurements, we found that this is what we were looking at. We did a cut across right about there, and a cut across right about there. Found a trench along the north wall, inside of the north wall, and I found a circular trench outside the north wall. This is the way the compound, I mean the entire Alamo layout works out when you do all the measurements and, and whatnot. You can see the main south gate fortifications, and you can see what we found in the north courtyard. Didn't get talked up very much because we found only small sections of it. Wasn't very exciting. But uh, when you work out the plan of it, it starts getting considerably more imposing. One of the other things we, uh, that I wound up doing was trying to make sense out of a strange little document that George was just showing you some preliminary drawings of his ideas how it works. This is the way the uh, church looked in about 1739, 1793. I've 
got dyslexia of my mouth. And uh, this is about as far as the building got when it was constructed. This is the plan that George was uh, showing you a sketch of. And it appears to be a guide thing from, uh, from master masons uh, to a master carpenter to build the roofing over this. It includes measurements. And uh, it's associated with a document that is a detailed uh, statement of what needs to be done and the amount of measurements uh, uh, of wood that need to be found to do that work. It kind of works out so that you can do a roof like that over the, that's the nave of the church. This is, you have to keep in mind, this is my end of the fight. George has a, a different viewpoint. So uh, this is my interpretation of what the document implies for, for the construction. Uh, side view, very flat, very low um, roofing structure. Uh, hardly any relief to it at all. Uh, I think there was a uh, layer of earth and clay and possibly plaster on top to seal it like any other standard um, roofing, uh, flat roof structure in, in the San Antonio area. Looking down at the plan of the church, this is how I worked out the actual structure would look based on that drawing. This is a couple of um, curious things that archaeology has found and document research has found. Um, it's two of a number, a, a large number of questions that can be asked <laughs> uh, about the history of the church and the history of the convento. One of them is, for example, there is a document. This roofing thing was, uh, was drawn in uh, 1809 and, uh, no, 1810, and was intended to be done to the building to make it into a uh, storage operation. And that uh, would also protect the would the stone structure of the place in case they wanted it wanted to be used as a church at a later date. Um, without that, it was unprotected walls and would continue to weather away and fall as it has wound up doing every time they're not doing sufficient protection. But um, so it was a curious document and it uh, led to some observations, but the critical use right now is that the documents of the plan and of the intended work record a number of details about the structure of the church that aren't recorded elsewhere. So it gives us a glimpse of the fabric, the structure, what is still standing, how far the construction got as of uh, about 1810. And sure enough, it turns out to be very similar to the 1772 inventory and the 1793. But still, every bit you can come up with is uh, useful and helps you quite a bit in some of the vague questions of that place. Uh, the Alamo trenching that we found indicates that the La Bastida map shows a fairly reasonably good schematic drawing of the fortification and defenses in the north courtyard. Um, it was, in fact, as soon as we began to realize we had a great big trench, we, we were aware that it would almost certainly have to be the trench as shown in the La Bastida plan. So we figured the odds were pretty good that um, let me get back to where I can, yeah. The odds were pretty good that the circular trench would be there too if we got lucky and had survived uh, with all the construction of streets. And I don't know what generation of wall the stone wall is now. Um, 
and sure enough, the one little section that we could get open, there was the trench. Points of my story, points I'm trying to make here, is that the uh, research that you do in advance is a huge help when you run into things that you're not sure what they are. And that events that happened at various times in the past to a building like the Alamo is not necessarily fully uh, expressed in the documents that you find. And you have to be prepared to take what slight evidence a given document tells you and run with it to uh, come up with speculative drawings of roofs uh, with more than one possible interpretation, according to my colleague. Uh, we, we need to put some money on that one way or the other. Of course, you can't prove it one way or the other. So history, archaeology, and architectural history are complex, difficult things, and you never know what's going to pop out of the box and amaze you when you start pushing the analysis or seeing what it means or trying to figure out that, what that one word is, that's messed up means in that, in that sentence. That's primarily what I came to tell you tonight was these odd little back corners. So I'm done, thank you. Well, I'm still Scott Woodard and tonight I'm gonna to tell you about the US Army at the Alamo from 1846 to 1877 and you may ask yourself, Woody, what are you wearing tonight? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is an 1872 officer's undress fatigue blouse. So because we're talking about the Army during this time frame, this is what a surgeon would have worn at the Alamo in 1872. Now, I'm not really a doctor, but I played one on Tuesday nights at this committee meeting. And of course, because I'm playing a doctor, you also need to know that my views do not represent the Department of Defense, the Army Medical Department, or Fort Sam Houston, or the Department of Defense. Everything is my view and my personal opinion. So if you've ever worked for a bureaucracy, you'll understand that very much. With the arrival of the Second Dragoons in October 1845, the U.S. Army utilized the Alamo and the surrounding buildings as a quartermaster depot and office space soon after its arrival in San Antonio in 1846 until the movement to the Quadrangle in present-day Fort Sam Houston in 1877. The ruins of the Alamo did not present a good picture. In 1843, Englishman William Boller documented in his journal the complex as grown over with weeds, moss, and even shrubs growing out of the cracks in its walls, brought back to life as a critical hub for supply distribution in support of the war with Mexico, the U.S. Army managed supplies and equipment shipped from New Orleans and continued to supply and equip outlying forts and camps across Texas long afterward. Upon annexation, the Republic of Texas, the state of Texas's disputed boundary with Mexico between the Rio Grande and the Nueces River, covering about 130 to 150 miles, now had a larger new army ready to counter the Mexican cavalry operating in the disputed territory. The U.S. Army's mission was threefold. Protect the Mexican border along the Rio Grande, the Indian frontier from Del Rio north to the Panhandle, and then third, the Overland Express between San Antonio and El Paso. Sergeant Edward Everett, wounded and unable to deploy with the troops with Mexico, became an assistant quartermaster. From his misfortune, we have the fortune of incredible documentation of the Alamo in words and pictures. He detailed the ruinous state of the buildings and how they cleared debris from the interior, finding quite a few skeletons. It is possible that the remains found may be from the earth excavated by the Mexican Army in 1835 and built up inside the chapel to create the artillery ramp. The belief is that it may have been taken from the former graveyard of the mission. The quartermasters converted the space for stores of quartermaster, ordnance, and medical supplies, established blacksmith, carpenter, and harness workshops, and created stables and mule yards. Offices were furnished with cots, and placed on the second floor of the old convento. Everett describes the church having no ornamental architecture other than the front, and it was respected as a historic relic, and as such, its characteristics were not marred by us. Not all who entered the ruins were so reflective. This engraving is found within the door threshold of the Alamo Chapel building. 
It appears to be signed by Dr. Ira E. Oatman in 1847. It is interesting that he wanted posterity to realize this tag was done by a medical doctor. It is unknown whether he passed through San Antonio as a soldier, but he later served in the California militia in the 1860s as an assistant surgeon. And a good friend of mine argued with me and said, Woody, I don't think that was really a doctor because you can actually read his name. The quartermaster department converted the old convent into a two-story warehouse in 1847. In 1849, the U.S. Army 8th Military District, consisting of Mission Concepcion and the headwaters of the San Antonio River, was established in San Antonio. The, the dilapidated former Alamo Church was repaired and a roof added in 1850 under the engineering of Major Edwin B. Babbitt, who actually recommended the demolishment. At the time, the restoration cost $5,000. So with inflation to 2021, that's a little over $171,000. George Nelson has presented the idea that the plan of the shape of the facade, or maybe even the stones themselves, came from the convent of Mission San Jose. Another watercolor by Sergeant Everett clearly shows the same shape. But after 1850, it is no longer there. Army Assistant Surgeon Ebenezer Swift married Sarah Edwards Capers on February 18, 1852, here in San Antonio. But before marrying his San Antonio bride, Swift had traveled through San Antonio from New Orleans to Camp Martin Scott in Fredericksburg and briefly wrote of his experience to an old friend in April of 1850, lamenting that his horse had gone missing en route. While there, he met the architect of the newly built warehousing complex, Major Babbitt. This is what he writes. I remained but a few days in San Antonio. The weather was very warm, the streets very dusty, everybody was very uncomfortable, and I very ill-natured. I didn't fall in love with your friend, Major Babbitt, and I never shall. I can't warp my affections into such narrow channel. I wish you could replace him. I wish, I wish that meets a hearty response from many anxious souls along this unhappy line. Sergeant Everett may not have had the same opinion of the man, but he did comment on the work done by Major Babbitt and showed some gratitude later on. So Everett wrote, I regret to see by a late engraving of this ruin that tasteless hands have evened off the rough walls as they, left, as they were left by the siege, surmounting them with a ridiculous scroll, giving the building and the appearance of a headboard of a bedstand. The care thus shown, however questionable the taste of its execution, is highly commendable. When compared with the wanton destruction with which other curious buildings in the vicinity have visited by relic hunters and other vandals and iconoclasts. We can thank Brigadier General Thomas S. Jessup, Quartermaster General of the U.S. Army, for squashing Babbitt's good idea. Although in ruins and pillaged by locals using the limestone to build their own homes, the Army salvaged what was left of Santa Ana's Army's unsuccessful attempt to completely burn the chapel down after the battle in 1836 with a wooden roof, second floor, and now iconic facade over the chapel. Squatters soon became a problem, but the Catholic Church claimed ownership and merely claimed they were using church property. The issue went to court and the verdict was against the city of San Antonio and the Catholic Church was successful in its claim to the Alamo. The U.S. Army paid $150 in rent each month thereafter. Throughout the 1850s, court hearings and negotiations worked out agreements for rental property between the Catholic Diocese, the city of San Antonio, and private citizens such as Alamo's neighbor, Samuel Maverick. Alamo Plaza businessman James and William Vance rental property was known as the Brick Block and served as the depot headquarters, barracks, and additional storerooms. The Gunter Hotel now occupies this site. Seemingly not to be outdone by a possible civilian, Captain Lafayette Boyer Wood, 8th U.S. Infantry, wrote his name in one of the columns inside the Alamo Storehouse in 1854. Army rosters show he was stationed in San Antonio and also served at Forts Chadburn and Davis and Camp Johnson in Texas during this period. He graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1836 and served in the Mexican War where he, rec where he was recognized for gallantry and meritorious service at Monterrey, Contreras, and Churubusco. Additional period tagging to the interior of the Alamo reveal a fascination of the U.S. Army's quest to make their mark. The placement of block U.S. carvings into the upper levels of the storehouse are better understood realizing that the Army added a second story and flooring to the former chapel. 
With land purchased in 1855 on South Florida's, the San Antonio Arsenal complex began construction in 1858. This movement began the transition from the Alamo with an office building, powder magazine, and commanding officer's quarters. The first San Antonio Arsenal building was actually the first building constructed by the federal government for military purposes in Texas. During the Civil War, the Confederate government assumed control, and, over the, and after the war, the U.S. government finished construction in 1866 with the eventual completion of a stable and storehouse. Even before the war, the U.S. Army was spread about San Antonio with key infrastructure supporting its mission of protection across Texas and along the border. This bird's eye view, a very popular style in the late 1800s, shows from left to right the depot at the Alamo, the U.S. Army Hospital, U.S. Army Headquarters, and the Arsenal. Captain A.W. Reynolds, Assistant Quartermaster, reported in 1861 that the Quartermaster Department was occupying the buildings and surrounding area of the Alamo. The first floor of the former church, former defensive redoubt, now storehouse, was a granary, and the second floor was used by the storekeeper. The former convent, former barracks and hospital, now general quartermaster building, was a two-story building for offices, storerooms, packing rooms, saddler shops, harness room, and wagon shed, with mule sheds, wagon staging, hay storage, and carpenter and blacksmith shops. Additionally, the Vance building, remember the brick block, held a year's worth of supplies for five infantry regiments. Upon reoccupation of San Antonio after the War of the Rebellion by the U.S. Army, additional storage space was needed and rented around the Alamo Plaza. It was busy and crowded. The former chapel was gutted from a fire in 1861, but used again for warehousing. Barracks presented horrible conditions of disrepair coupled with the proximity to the San Antonio River's floodplain and dreaded miasmas inflicting disease. Water levels rose above the barracks floors around the Alamo Plaza in 1866 and 1869. So because the low-lying area utilized and offered to the Army was not satisfactory, city officials and businessmen began an earnest effort to appease federal government officials with favorable land and rental offers in expectation of the monetary windfall to follow permanent residency. After several relocations to Galveston and Austin, the U.S. Army's Department of Texas returned to San Antonio in November of 1870. Surgeon D. Bosch described the San Antonio garrison in his report on barracks and the hospitals in 1870, detailing, with the exception of the Alamo, all U.S. Army properties such as barracks, hospital, and storehouses were owned by private citizens and rented by the federal government. Bosch describes the Alamo as a storehouse occupied by the quartermaster department and used for forage, camp, and garrison equipage, and to some extent, for workshops. Like all surgeons of the Army Medical Department, Dr. Bosch kept meteorological records and reported them to the Army Surgeon General. The belief at this time was that weather and climate affected the health of soldiers, so meticulous records were kept. Curiously enough, the highest temperature recording in 1870 was in July at 102 degrees. In 1871, it was August with 109 degrees. 1872, August with 103. And finally, in 1873, May had 107 degrees. The first national weather data was collected by the Army Medical Department and would later be the foundation of the U.S. Weather Bureau and the National Weather Service. San Antonio quickly moved to encourage the U.S. Army to build upon their depot footprint in the city. Corruption and slow-moving bureaucracy within the U.S. government stymied the attempt to harness the limited fiscal life of congressional budgets. Illegal moves by the Secretary of War against congressional and presidential orders prevented the funds to provide a new Army post in San Antonio up until 1875. Finally, after numerous offers for land title, the Army accepted the city's deed for 93 acres for a section of land deemed Government Hill. U.S. Army Quartermaster General Montgomery C. Miggs was finally able to announce in, on October the 10th, 1877, after seven years of back and forth, he said, quote, Offices and supplies of the depot of the Quartermaster Department at San Antonio have already been removed to the new building and the Alamo, which has been rented for many years, given up. Saved from piecemeal dismantlement from pilfering in 1846 and saved by renovation instead of demolition in 1850, the Army kept the Alamo secure for 31 years. 
The relationship with San Antonio and the U.S. Army continues today. Good evening. Many of you will not recognize this view as Alamo Plaza. You would be correct. This is the southeast corner of Military Plaza, and it, was, it actually illustrates one of the factors in the beginning of the evolution of Alamo Plaza into a modern plaza of a city. You'll recall that the Spaniards had three uh, primary plazas in San Antonio. There was Military Plaza, the home of the, uh, the military garrison, Main Plaza, the, which was based on the uh, civilian community, and across the river and at some distance was Alamo Plaza, which was the uh, home of the, uh, the Spanish missions. Alamo Plaza was, uh, was deserted. Uh, if you came to San Antonio in the uh, uh, mid-19th uh, century, you'd be facing a scene similar to this with a big racket outside your hotel window. Uh, it would be impossible to get a good night's sleep unless you visited some of the saloons nearby and uh, went up to your room and passed out. William Menger got the idea that uh, there was something to be done about that. So he built uh, what could be considered the first resort hotel in Texas on Alamo Plaza in 1859. It was quiet, uh, the rooms were expensive, uh, William Menger did uh, very well, and uh, the hotel flourished. What uh, also took advantage of the isolation of uh, Alamo Plaza was the, uh, the city market. The main city market was naturally enough on Market Street, and uh, it was at a time uh, in the 1860s and 70s before refrigeration had been uh, developed, and meat did not do very well in a close situation. It had some bad uh, aromas to it, and the place to put it was uh, as far from the city as uh, you could go and uh, still let people be able to uh, reach it and buy their meat. So that place happened to be Alamo Plaza. The meat market opened at uh, 2 in the morning, and by 7, the flies were so thick and the smells had gotten so bad that the market closed until uh, early in the, uh, the next morning. That doesn't seem to have... Uh, bothered the residents of the Menger Hotel, but it does have, seem to have kept a lot of space open uh, in the center of the plaza around the meat market. This actually caused Alamo Plaza to have a uh, key role in the uh, changing uh, of the American West. Uh, barbed wire had been invented by the 1870s, but the, a lot of old ranchers just couldn't get the idea that one strand of wire could contain a lot of cattle, and so nobody was buying barbed wire. In 1876, a salesman by the name of John W. Gates knew that there was a convention of cattlemen at the uh, Menger Hotel. He wanted to give them a demonstration of barbed wire and how well it worked, but he knew that he couldn't convince those skeptical ranchers to go uh, very far from the uh, hotel so he decided to bring barbed wire to them. He set up the, uh, a demonstration in the plaza of cattle not uh, uh, daring to go past the barbed wire. The cattlemen were astonished. Uh, barbed wire sales uh, skyrocketed, and the, uh, the range uh, was fenced. Uh, no longer did you have uh, stray cattle going from one uh, rancher's property to another, and uh, there were no more uh, mavericks allowed to uh, get in uh, in the way and, and uh, confuse people as to uh, who owned it, who owned them. Uh, this was uh, ironic because right at the, uh, at the far left corner of this uh, view, you can see the home of the, uh, the man who gave the name to Maverick, Sam Maverick, who had also uh, brings the story full circle. He had been a, a defender of the Alamo and uh, before the fall was sent to uh, sign the uh, Texas Declaration of, uh, of Independence. The Mavericks owned a lot of land along uh, Alamo Plaza, and as the uh, uh, plaza began, as the city began to grow and people began to move in, uh, two of his sons built the, uh, the Crockett Block in 1883. Uh, it's an example of how uh, good architecture was beginning to arrive on uh, Alamo Plaza. This was designed by Alfred Giles uh, down the street. The Reuter Building was designed by James Warrenberger, and the Menger Hotel itself had been uh, designed by a homegrown architect, very good, by the name of uh, John Fries. 
So things were uh, looking up for Alamo Plaza. Uh, people were uh, coming in in uh, conventions. This was a uh, convention in uh, 1883 of some men that wanted to get really up close and personal with the Alamo, uh, and they did. Uh, in the background, you can see that uh, uh, Alamo Plaza was taking on some of the characteristics of the uh, of military plaza. That's the Alamo Saloon in that uh, uh, building right uh, behind this uh, group of men. Uh, for those of you who can read the, uh, uh, the caption, uh, this was a convention of the BRRP, which, uh, if you don't know what that is, it is the Brotherhood of Railroad Brakemen. This would not have been a good time with these men, uh, the brakemen in front of the Alamo, to have been riding on a train outside San Antonio because you'd think it would never stop. But uh, that did not uh, keep these people from uh, uh, enjoying their visit to the Alamo. Alamo Plaza became a uh, center of uh, civic activity. This is a, uh, uh, at a visit by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1905. You can see the Alamo Convento here in a role as, uh, as balcony, uh, as a, two levels of uh, balconies for people to uh, hear the speech in a, in a time of uh, very, uh, uh, very poor public address systems. You had to, to be a successful politician. You had to have uh, uh, a good, loud voice, and, and Theodore Roosevelt certainly did. Alamo Plaza began to be civilized uh, by the, uh, say, 1905. This is a view looking south from the, uh, the old federal building. Uh, you can see the convento at your front left. Uh, to its right, uh, uh, there were uh, horses uh, parked. If you wanted your shopping at the plaza or visiting the courthouse, you could stop, park your, uh, tie your horses up, and that's a small fountain and uh, uh, watering trough right uh, in front uh, of you. The uh, plaza was uh, landscaped as well as uh, military and uh, main plazas at the time. And if you look at uh, Alamo Street and follow at the right and follow it south, you will see that it narrows and you may be able to see uh, to the right at the end of the street a very elaborate tower uh, which stood on the, uh, which topped the, uh, uh, the Dulnig building, which was a, a department store at the corner of Commerce Street. Uh, this is the area that was widened in a street widening project about 1910. They took off the, uh, they took off the tower to make room for the new street and uh, sheared off the uh, facades of a number of those buildings. And we can thank that now for the, uh, you know, the swift flow of traffic that we have through uh, Alamo Plaza. By this time, uh, Alamo uh, Plaza had really become the, uh, as this uh, postcard says, San Antonio's center of business life, as well of as well of the history of the city. You have not just the Alamo; you have a, a fine um, a federal building uh, at the head of it, and a number of uh, first-rate uh, commercial buildings along uh, to your left, coming down to the, uh, the building in the, in the uh, front left, which is the turrets of the uh, San Antonio Opera House. Quite uh, considered by this time, basically, the, uh, the center of town. It had replaced mil both military and uh, main plaza in that regard, and it was a place where things happened. Uh, you had parades. If you look down the uh, facades on the, on the, of the stores along here, you can get an idea of some of the uh, types of businesses we had on Alamo Plaza. There's a souvenir shop, cigar store, uh, drug store, and uh, so on down to a bank right at the, uh, at the end of the street. And in addition, of course, you had uh, fiesta parades. This is one of uh, several military parades that uh, uh, traversed uh, Alamo Plaza. In addition to the uh, uh, Opera House, there were several smaller theaters. This is the Plaza Theater, which stood uh, on the site of Joskies. Uh, this is where many of uh, the first talking movies were uh, shown in San Antonio starting in the uh, 1920s. But there was a sore thumb project with uh, problem with uh, Alamo Plaza in the minds of many of the businessmen. 
Here you were trying to uh, promote San Antonio as a very modern city with sleek modern plazas. And what do you have sticking right out in the middle of Alamo Plaza, right in front of this beautiful uh, federal building, but a rather unsightly uh, frame uh, appearing structure, a frame facade anyway, which was the, uh, the Alamo uh, Convento. This was a, a serious problem. And this was the uh, beginning or the origin of the story that uh, many, of, uh, uh, many of us have, have heard that the uh, Alamo uh, was going to be torn down for a hotel. Well, this uh, depends on what your definition of Alamo is and what your definition of four is. This is the, an idea of the plan that was uh, proposed for Alamo Plaza. And as you can see, uh, the Alamo itself, uh, as we call the Alamo, is standing to the right. And the hotel that was planned is that large building at the very rear. What is not there is in this plan is the Convento, which was uh, going to be not replaced by a hotel, but it was going to be the site of an Alamo monument and provide a very fine view of the uh, uh, of Alamo Plaza from the, uh, from the hotel. You didn't have that, uh, that uh, ugly uh, convento in the way anymore. This was about the time that the uh, Daughters of the Republic of Texas had organized, and uh, Adina de Zavala, who was quite a romantic uh, school, uh, school teacher with a background in history, thought the, uh, the convento should not be torn down. Uh, she was able to uh, find a, a wealthy ranching heiress named Clara Driscoll, and together uh, they schemed on how to keep the uh, convento from being torn down. They decided that uh, uh, no one was going to save the convento was not a very good, uh, very good slogan to persuade people to part with their, their dollars but that uh, really the, uh, most of the fighting in the Alamo had taken place in the Convento and not so much in the Alamo Church itself. Therefore, the Convento was the Alamo. Therefore, the Alamo had to be saved. And this is uh, how uh, Adina de Zavala planned to uh, save the Convento. It was, uh, she was a, uh, a romantic. Uh, uh, she felt it should be made into a uh, Texas uh, Hall of Fame with uh, some rather imaginary uh, pillars at uh, either end. This was not something that Clara Driscoll thought uh, should happen. She felt that the Convento actually overshadowed the uh, Alamo and uh, should be uh, taken down. Both of, uh, both of these women were rather high-spirited. They had short tempers, and they fell out. Uh, Dina's De Zavala, not if money is power, she did not have the power, and she was replaced by uh, Clara Driscoll and her daughters, and this is what happened to the Convento. Uh, there was still a little bit in the, in the way of the, uh, uh, of the view from this uh, hotel, which was actually never built, and that is the upper level of these walls of the, uh, of the Convento. Politics uh, was in the way as much as anything in those days as now. The governor uh, believed that the upper walls were the convento and should remain. Uh, the, the lieutenant governor thought they were ugly and should be torn down. So Clara Driscoll, when she knew the governor was out of town, she got the lieutenant governor to, to authorize the destruction of the upper level here of the uh, convento walls leaving us with uh, a convento or a long barrack with uh, simply uh, the remains of uh, uh, the lower portions of two walls to, uh, to be restored and preserved for the future. What happened was the uh, uh, convento or the, uh, uh, the walls of the long barracks were left open. Uh, some of the stone was uh, preserved to build a little arcade behind them, and uh, then a, uh, a wall around the approximate location of the original convento, and uh, the rest of the uh, back half of the Alamo property uh, remained with some older buildings until the uh, uh, Clara Driscoll made another appearance in 1936 with the uh, Texas Centennial when uh, Centennial funds were used to help purchase that property and the uh, the buildings were removed, and uh, we had the northern end of Alamo Plaza looking not uh, not too unlike the way it does now, but with all the uh, 
the buildings from before 1936 uh, removed. Uh, Alamo Plaza, in spite of these uh, rather radical changes to the appearance of the Alamo, has still retained a, a great feeling in the uh, minds and uh, hearts of uh, San Antonians as a center of town. Uh, for more than uh, 40 years, uh, maybe even more than 50, uh, the San Antonio light symbolized this uh, local feeling of uh, pride and importance in the Alamo Plaza with its, uh, with its column uh, around the plaza, which gave you the sense that all you had to do to find out what was going in town is just to go out, take a stroll around the plaza, and uh, talk to your friends, and you could get uh, enough news to, uh, to fill a, uh, a, a long uh, daily newspaper column, very chatty, which, uh, which it did. And this is uh, a feeling, even though the light is gone, this is something that uh, uh, today, although the plaza has uh, continued to change considerably, uh, still in the hearts and minds of many San Antonians is a, a very critical and important part of uh, our city. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, there's a couple of people I want to point out in the audience. Uh, Ernesto, Ernesto Rodriguez, who's been here at the Alamo, what, 19 years, and a very good historian, was my my assistant. Uh, Christy, Christy Nichols is uh, our archeologist who's here on site. And uh, Pam, Pam Rosser over here, raise your hand. Uh, she's our conservationist. And so these people are important because of, we're talking about the modern Alamo. They're currently involved in in preserving the Alamo and interpreting the Alamo. Uh, questions that we would get from visitors. Uh, one of the questions we would get is, why is it downtown? And of course for us, we're going, well, we know that because it was here first. But uh, a lot of visitors don't necessarily know that. And it goes back to the importance of, of why is it a plaza for the church? Why is it a plaza for the Spanish military, Mexican military? Why does it become a commercial, a commercial center? Because it's an important place. Now, when you talk about the Battle of the Alamo to visitors, sometimes they'll go, if it was so important, why wasn't it saved? And that's a, an, an important question. And it, the answer again goes back to the place, the site was always important. And so it continued to be used until enough, I'll put it in air quotes, enough progress came and the, and the Comanches are pushed away that the town can begin to actually develop. And it starts developing around the Alamo. So it's a, a natural place for for, de for development. Now, one of the questions we sometimes get is, um, when did it become a shrine? When did people, people didn't used to care about the Alamo. When did they start doing that? You know, was that Walt Disney? Was that uh, the 1960 movie? Actually, the place became an unofficial shrine shortly after the battle. You get uh, Sam Houston in March of 1836, talking about the Texans being Spartans and what goes with Spartans, but the Battle of Thermopylae. And so the Alamo became known as Texas Thermopylae. So when you look at visitors who come to San Antonio in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, even after that, often what they'll say is, I have to go to the Alamo, the place where Davy Crockett was murdered or Jim Bowie. And so it became uh, a, uh, a visitor destination very early. But that goes back to, well, if it's so important, why do they keep changing it? And it's San Antonio is a frontier town. Buildings are important, so they get used, adaptive reuse. So they get used, and they get used, and they get used again. And it's about into the eight, uh, 19th century that things change. Now, things are th changing in the 19th century in the United States. Uh, 
still a very young country, but it's progressed enough. It's a hundred years and more. So there's sort of a celebration of history and of places and of people. And this idea, much like uh, you're seeing the World War II de generation pass away, there's where are the American Revolution people? Where are the people who fought in the Mexican War? In Texas, where are the people who taught, fought in the Texas Revolution? And so in the 1870s, you get the Texas, uh, Texas um, Veterans Association. But in the 1890s, what you get is, as, as the originals, people who set up the organization begin to die off, you get into the descendants. And by the 1890s, you get into the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. And they come into the story, again, right in, in the history of the United States, when people are going, we need to save our past. We need to honor our veterans. You know, now we're so prosperous, we don't have to reuse buildings. We can go back and we can start start honoring things. And so that's what really um, 18, 1873, or excuse me, 18, 1882, the church buys, or the state buys the church to, to keep it in out of private hands. Um, but um, still this idea, we need to do something, we should do something. Now we talked about the old long barrack and uh, one of the things is that it had been turned into a mercantile establishment by Henri Grenet, and then it was sold to the Hugo Smeltzer firm. And throughout that re reiteration, you know, the facade was put up on the two stories that uh, the quartermasters had, had were innovated. But by 1900, in that period, um, it, was, it was vacant. And vacant buildings don't look very attractive, especially when we're talking about we're trying to develop the plaza. We're tr we have a railroad that comes to San Antonio. We have, you saw the tracks that went through Alamo Plaza. And so what are we gonna do? If you go to uh, Clara Driscoll's papers down in Corpus Christi, she has a lot of photographs, a lot of uh, notes talking about the long barrack is horrible because it's being used as billboards. So here's a sign saying there's a racetrack, you know, go visit the racetrack, you know, circus coming to town, all these things. So it's being used sort of as a vacant build where people kind of, kind of like where your cat would be lost and you'd take it and staple it on the wall. So that's what the long barrack had, had become. Now, we've already mentioned uh, Adina de Zavala and Clara Driscoll, and, and they were two powerful women. And they did come together with the idea of we want to save the Alamo. But the question they never really asked each other was, what's the Alamo to you? And as Lewis said, Adina de Zavala is going, it's the convento. And Claire Driscoll's going, oh, that's a trashy old building. And there, there's a document in the Driscoll Foundation where Clara is writing a note saying, everybody knows I bought it to tear it down. So that sort of blows a hole in the, uh, you know, saving the Alamo, but for her, idea is let's get rid of this trashy old building and focus on the true shrine, which is going to be the church. And when you stand out in the plaza today, you can clearly see that argument and who won it, because you've got the church as the prominent feature, Long Barrack as the secondary feature. Now, when the DRT was given custody in 1905, uh, two things. It would be kept as a memorial, a sacred memorial for the men who immolated themselves on that hallowed ground, it means they sacrificed themselves. And the other is they would do it at no cost. So 
Alamo eventually becomes very expensive, expensive to run. So that's going to, to affect the later DRT custodianship at the Alamo. But what, what Adina De Zavala had wanted was a, a Texas museum, Museum of Texas History. Uh, what Clara Driscoll wanted was a park. And so her idea was, and her words were, we want to parkify the area. And so under her, the idea is they, they actually ask members, you know, bring flowers, bring cuttings. And so the Longberry, which had been reduced to just one wall at one point, um, the Spanish courtyard became a rose garden, became, uh, you know, we've got to beautify the area, we've got to parkify it. By the 1920s, DRT is moving into the church and setting up a uh, visitor center, little desk, relics, and things. But uh, and visitors who would come through would, you know, I've got to go see the Alamo. They still are, are saying that. It's in the late 20s and 1930s when things really begin to happen, when you've got the WPA coming in. And the WPA era really gives us the idea of what we got now. Uh, sidewalks out here, they're established in the WPA era. The arcade that's out front on the south side of the church, that's WPA. And uh, in the church, church still being used as, as a shrine visitor center, uh, a new roof, the army quartermaster roof that was wooden was finally removed, concrete roof taken in, flagstone was laid. And as I was told, they laid the flagstone because as the plaza kept getting higher and higher, that water would come into the to the church, and so it's more or less, we've got to do that. Um, plaques were placed inside with the defenders' names and talking about the mission. But again, we owe a lot to that WPA when you get to the, to the church and the way the church looks now. What we owe um, Hemisphere, Hemisphere 68, is the, what we have now is the Long Barrack Museum. That the DRT, knowing that people are gonna come in, uh, wanted to have a, a museum. And so the, the ruins of the Long Barrack were converted, the walls were raised, it was roofed, and it was then uh, converted into the Long Barrack Museum. So the museum in the Long Barrack and the church and this property where we are, this is an old fire station uh, that was given over to the DRT and we're in state property. Uh, but what we know of as the modern Alamo complex happens under the state ownership and the DRT and afterwards. So when we walk out of here and we see all the walls that's from that time period. Now, what I would have come to, to realize is that when we look at the Alamo, often we divide it into different periods. You know, this period, and then this period. And we get the idea that this period is completely different from this period. And what I would say is the transitions are not necessarily that sharp that they're sometimes very smooth. And it's the same people in the same buildings. And so I think that instead of looking at the differences, you need to look at the continuity and the fact that we've got the long barrack and we still have the church is a long train of continuity. You know, they're different, but they're still there. So having said that, I will, I will sit down. Thank you very much. You're very timely. I, I thought I was going to have more more warning. So, uh, thank you so much. Can we have uh, another round of applause for our wonderful, wonderful presenters? Now, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sharon Skrbarczyk, uh daughter of the Republic of Texas. 
The Daughters of the Republic of Texas were responsible for saving the Alamo in the early 20th century uh, and were custodians for over 100 years. The committee wanted to be sure that they were represented in this meeting. I'd like to introduce Jeannie Travis, a sixth generation Texan and longtime member of the Alamo Mission chapter of the, of the DRT. She is the most immediate former president of the Fiesta Commission and very involved with how San Antonio honors the Alamo. Many a military leader has uh, received their instructions from Jeannie on local uh, San Antonio and Alamo protocol. I also want to introduce Pam Rosser, the Alamo's conservator, who has spent over 10 years preserving and documenting the Alamo Church and Long Barrack. She's also a member of the DRT and is a ninth generation Texan. She began her career as a partner with her mother, who was also a conservator. Um, they're both joining our speakers as panelists for this discussion. So Jeannie, Travis on the end, and Pam Rosser is next to her. Would y'all wave? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Davis Phillips. For those of you that I have not met, I've had the privilege to be a part of this committee since 19, well, not 1994. See, <laughs> I will tell you, since I've been here from the beginning, it seems like 1994. Uh, since 2014, when the group started, and I represent the travel and tourism industry, and you guys did such a great job talking about some of these topics that I had to scratch off a few of my questions as we were going through here. So we're going to have a little bit of time to get into some more details here. Um, how have both the significance and the uses of the church in Long Barrack changed over time? And, and some of you guys touched on that as we went, but um, we're, we don't have to go in order as anybody wants to speak, but this is a chance for us to open it up and dive a little bit further into some of these detailed topics the significance and uses of the church in Long Barracks changed over time. I think, is our, our mics on? Can y'all hear it okay? Uh, I know that uh, looking back at my own personal experience as a soldier occupying an area uh, in Afghanistan, I was embedded with the Afghan National Army, and so mm. we would get to, we called them buildings of opportunity. And so sometimes you know what was there before you got there, and sometimes you didn't. And the Army, I see coming in in the 1840s, they're having buildings of opportunity they take advantage of, and they use it to be able to com complete their mission. And it's kind of ironic that uh, in doing that, they're still here. So that's my perspective of coming in, just taking a building of opportunity. They, Edward Everett talks about he knew it was historic, and they had some reverence for it, but he still had a mission. He had to make a granary and an office. So. Okay, very good. Dr. Winders? I think what it, the use of the long barrack in the church, they reflect whatever the need of the community was at that time. Uh, one of the things we often do is we separate the Alamo from San Antonio, but they're, they're related. And so uh, you've, you've got the mission, which served one of the original functions of of uh, building a Spanish community from indigenous people. You've got, uh, for, for much of its history, San Antonio was a frontier. And that's why you've got Spanish military, Mexican military, and then the, the, the US Army. And, and, and as I said, it's fairly, well, I, 100 years is, I'm going to say it's fairly recent, you know, that 100 years and <laughs> that recent. It's all about perspective. But uh, that has been free to be actually turned into different things, whether it's commercial or for, for honor. It's interesting that um, some of the discussions around how it's changed and the, and the controversies at those times, and then here we find ourselves today going through some of the same types of situations, talking about how to use the buildings and what to do and stuff. Very interesting. Any other thoughts on this topic from anybody? One, yes, sir. Uh, one use that has uh, increased, especially uh, at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, has been uh, using the, uh, the halo effect of the, uh, uh, the Alamo for uh, private uh, purposes. Uh, many 
uh, businesses like to be uh, photo have their people photographed in front of the Alamo, their products photographed in, uh, in front of the Alamo. Uh, even to the, the point that uh, many of you will remember the, uh, the Alamo National Bank and wonder how it got the name Alamo. Well, that's because the, the directors actually formed the bank in a meeting in the, uh, the Convento. And that, uh, since it was formed in the Alamo, that gave them the, the right to call it the Alamo National Bank. Okay. And, and, and yes, sort, please. Sort of we have plenty of time. Go ahead. Reinforcing that, there's an 18... 54 newspaper published here in San Antonio, and it was called the Alamo Star. Hmm. And uh, its opening edition says, we're the Alamo Star because it reflects all of this. But it, it for, for better or worse, I think it's sort of a point where, you know, the Alamo as the battle and that identity starts to eclipse the mission period. And, um, but, but so, so, you know, we're the Alamo City. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes, and if you go to, uh, if you go to Europe and you say you're from San Antonio, the response is usually the Alamo. Right, right, for sure. Ms. Travis, did you have something you wanted to say? I do. I think now that the Alamo, it belongs to everybody. It's a celebratory place. It is a reverent place. And all the millions of people that come here take something from her when they leave. They feel the Alamo now. We're telling the story. There are the legends. There are the heroes. There's the the cottage industries that came across, the city ran about it, and the, the, the Alamo is the heart of San Antonio. And the, the military has been part of the fiber of the Alamo on all sides from the beginning of time, and it's an amazing thing to see the armed forces of today come and pay their respects here and they bring their commands. It is a mm -hmm. part of their training, their indoctrination. And the fiesta began here in the, at the Alamo, very Alamo Plaza, 1891. And here we are, 2021, trying it again. So it's changed, it, it just belongs to everyone. It's free and open. And um, I think you leave the Alamo wanting more. I think the, 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 I applaud everything that this organization, this group is doing because you're trying to teach the Alamo. And it leaves people wanting more. They want to study more. They want to hear more. And so many of the millions that do come here have a tie here somewhere, somehow. Maybe it was an ancestor. There's a story here that's being built every day with every person that comes. One of the things that's so interesting is the is the kind of passion that the Alamo oh, yes. pulls out of everybody and can certainly see it with you mm -hmm. tonight. So thank you. Another question is how do the buildings affect the telling of the story of the Battle of 1836 as well as all the stories of the site? And without those buildings, do you think the stories could have been lost to history? I would often talk to, when I was talking to visitors, I uh, wonder if the Alamo were 20 miles outside of town, you know, how mm. you know, how many people, but the fact that it's downtown and it's like, oh, we're walking across the plaza, oh, what's that building? It's the Alamo. Uh, it, it has a, its location is just designed to to focus attention on it. And, and the buildings that we have uh, do enable us to, I don't say enable, but um, we're, we're sort of, uh, we're hampered by telling the story with what is here because the buildings don't look exactly like they did during the battle or sure. the mission period or, or anything else. Right. And so what we've got is a composite which really works for us because you look at the church and you've got the you've got the mission period, but you also have the quartermaster period. You look at the long barrack and you've got uh, the long history that's there that you can explain. But then you look around the perimeter 
And uh, I know that there's been talk about, well, what if we didn't have the Crockett block? What Samuel Maverick, you know, talking about the, the continuity, that's part mm -hmm. of the story. And so um, I think the challenge is to develop narratives that explain what people don't see and then say, yes, there's more here than Certainly, that meets so, the eye, so yeah. Using the buildings, but also overcoming the limitations of the buildings. It's interesting to think that if the, that you spoke about the effort to save the buildings and the significance of that. And, you know, would we be here today having these discussions if, if those buildings had been taken down? You know, we don't, we don't know, but it's an interesting uh, uh, question, certainly. Any other thoughts on that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'd like to say that the Alamo and the Long Barrack add texture to telling the story because the walls reveal the evidence of the mission era as well as the uh, historic graffiti that we've discovered from various periods. And they, those pieces of evidence just help tell the story when you're relaying those to the visitors. Point. One, uh, one point that uh, could be remembered is the, the early date at which the importance of saving the building uh, occurred. Uh, the Alamo itself uh, was saved. Uh, it was a, someone had mentioned earlier about the importance of the, the Alamo as a shrine where people had died and, and uh, had served. Uh, the historic preservation movement in the United States grew uh, in the East uh, for saving uh, uh, remains and monuments, buildings, uh, landmarks of the Revolutionary War. And the, uh, the first building uh, west of the Mississippi purchased uh, with public funds simply, for, simply to save it was the Alamo. And it was purchased, interestingly enough, uh, for the, not the American Revolution, but the, uh, the Texas Revolution. And so it really, uh, from uh, as early as uh, many other buildings in, in the country, was uh, uh, important for that. Any other thoughts from our panelists before I step on to the next question? OK. Um, was there anything else? That, one of the questions was uh, about the importance of the movement to save the buildings and this, you know, what that has led to. And, and you've some of you have touched on it. Dr. Winters, you touched a little bit more on it. But was there anything else that anybody wanted to say? I don't know if the ladies that represent the DRT wanted to talk more about that. Yes, go ahead. I can, yes. What's been amazing to me is that I've gone back very briefly in the, in the archives. There's 100 plus years of minutia details that the, that the Daughters of the Republic did. It, you have to remember, there, there are uh, 106 different chapters all over the state, and everyone has a project. San Antonio's project was the Alamo, and the old chapter, Alamo Mission, was geographically in charge of this as custodians. It's very interesting. You can go back in the records and see when the iron gates were, were installed, when they were repaired, when they were replaced. Over all these years, the, the minutia is magnificent. It is incredible um, history. And I found one example on the 100th anniversary of the, of the battle in 1936, in January. They were putting in the flagstone floor, the ladies. And one of the workmen, they removed the dirt floor and swept it clean to add, to install the flagstone. And one of the workmen knelt down and hammered in a wooden peg into the dirt. And it sank. Well, the ladies all came around, everyone came around and stopped, and it turned out that, that they excavated it with the archaeologist in residence nearby, and they found the bodies of four people. Two were pointing one direction, and two were born, uh, pointing the other. And so the daughters, to preserve that, built a cement vault, lined it with lead, with great detail, great ceremony, and great reverence, as we still do, 
um, the bodies were reinterred, and that's right smack in the middle of the shrine, right where the, the T is. You'll see a small thing. And that was discovered laying the floor in 1936. That's an example. The, the, the gardens, all of those things were done by somebody to meticulously preserve and protect this building and that building and these grounds. They were built together. The library was added. This Alamo Hall was an old fire station. And it was traded for a strip of land on Houston Street. We, the daughters were given this building. And to this building came the library. And all of the things that also were put into the museum that's now the gift shop, all those things were gathered over all these years by speakers that came. And they would give their grandfathers ledgers. They would give letters from somebody. They would give their daddy's um, rifle. They would give whatever in the world. Those, these particular archives and were built that way when people came here and saw a safe place to put it and to share it. And that's how all of this big collection was built. And it was the Alamo. And again, it goes back to one of the first great presentations. It depends what you call it. The Alamo is all of this to me, sure. and that's what is now in the hands of all of you that's to what's keep so it and protect it. We're there are so many facets of it oh, that people there's have so no many, idea. And it was meticulously done. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank Very you. Good. Last question we have for the panel tonight is what impact did the church and Long Barrack buildings have on the evolution of the plaza and the expansion of San Antonio into the 20th century? Mm -hmm. I know a few of you touched on it. But this is our chance again to get into some more detail on that. The, the reason that the Army comes here is because of the annexation treaty where the Texas joins. Is in it, it said that all Texas forts should be turned over uh, to the U.S. for its use. And in 1841, Republic of Texas uh, granted the archdiocese the Alamo property. They said, yes, it's yours, it's church property. And so, uh, you know, it keeps it from being commercialized at that point. But it's because of its reputation as a fort, even though that was erroneous, uh, that the U.S. Army comes here. And if the Army had not come to this location, then the idea of what would have happened to the Long American Church, you know, maybe it would have been taken apart for, for bricks and, and such. Yeah. But uh, it was the availability, or what the perceived availability was, that, that brings the Army here. Yeah, and I think uh, San Antonio was, you know, we were also talking with some other folks on the panel. Uh, San Antonio is the hub. It's, uh, it's not Dallas, it's not Houston. San Antonio, and the Army recognizes that it is a logistics compound that allows them to do supply distribution all the way up to El Paso, and then all the way up to north of the Panhandle with specific duties of defense. And they're also able to incorporate that. Their, their first thing they do when they hit the ground is start supplying the Army in order to get into Mexico and defend the border, the newly annexed border of the state. And so it's a prime position. And if you look at a map of all the Texas forts the U.S. Army established, they're all a horse's day ride from each other. Hmm. So I can, I as a logistician, can resupply the forts. I know I'm a day away from at least another group of soldiers. And so San Antonio is the perfect place to do that. And it had served that purpose for indigenous people, uh, for the Spanish, and that, that's what makes San Antonio special is it becomes a I hate to give you the word nexus, but it becomes a nexus where, or a crossroads where it doesn't matter who you are, you're coming through here. And uh, you're not necessarily coming to the Alamo, this sounds like heresy, uh, but you're coming to San Antonio, mm -hmm. where the Alamo is. Okay. Mr. Nelson, do you have something you wanted to say? Uh, well, I think that part of this. Part of the problem with dealing with the whole big issue is there is the 
sort of elephant in the room of the winners write the history books. And since 1836, we have had a peculiar slant on the Alamo and on the wars that developed it and its importance and its sacredness. But they were definitely people who do not feel that it is sacred or that it is, represents anything uh, great or glorious because from their point of view, uh, it represents uh, something negative. And mm -hmm. so uh, since you know, it is an axiom of truth that winners do write the history books, we do need to realize that the Spanish, oddly enough, and the Mexicans, if you read their writings, they're quite upset about problems with uh, border security and illegal immigrants and uh, uh, gangs and caravans of people coming in, and that the Alamo Company is actually brought here not to be a cavalry unit to fight Indians. Their main purpose, that they're here for 32 years, is basically border patrol. And they're a rapid deployment unit who are sent to East Texas constantly for pr problems facing uh, breaching of the border with Louisiana. Hmm. And so uh, there's a whole world of archival evidence of the geopolitical problems that lead to this eventually becoming uh, the famous site that it is. But uh, you know, parts of these stories are not uplifting and glorious. And you know, rarely will anybody, you know, bring this forth, but, you know, I think one of the odd things about this site is that it's not, you know, it's not a national park, in other words. Uh, it, and, and during the 1930s, and uh, Jake and I, you know, this is something that's very interesting, is... We weren't there then. Well, we were, we were <laughs> little. We were little. No, is that, is that there was no archaeologist at the site here, apparently, during the Depression. Whereas at Goliad, oh, yeah. there was a uh, two intense uh, excavations at uh, the missions down there, very good excavations, uh, magnificent excavations. Yet here, there seemed to have been no interest in studying the site objectively. The site already had an, a received history, and therefore, it didn't need archaeological excavation. We already know, you know everything about it, and, and, and so it's odd that Goliad, you know, had such intense archaeological excavations, and here, nothing. Interesting. I know one of the things we've talked about, and I've said before, is that I think the opportunity and the challenge with, with what's before us is to tell all of these interesting stories and these different perspectives without having to place blame or take sides and allow the person getting the information to make their own decisions. But the kind of information that you guys have spoken about tonight needs needs to be included, and I appreciate you guys being here. Before we wrap up, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Is there anybody else that would like to say something before we finish the panelist? Okay. Speak now or forever hold your peace, folks. This is it. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Francisco. Thank you so much, Davis. Uh, so, friends, Thank you for joining us tonight for the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee uh, content sessions. Thank you so much to our distinguished panelists. Uh, tremendous education you've given us all tonight. Uh, for those of us uh, watching from home, uh, we hope you continue to, to join us and, and continue to stream uh, all of the content that we're going to be putting together as we all work as a city, as a community, as a state to learn more about all of the stories uh, that make up the Alamo. So thank you very much. On behalf of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, thank you for joining us. The stories of the Alamo are layered and complex. We hope this session has provided some insight and will make your next visit to the Alamo more meaningful. We look forward to continuing these conversations.